I mean, it's a massive subject. I thought the interview with Diana Lundberg last night was, was really excellent, and I would encourage you to watch the plenary session. I thought she raised some tremendously helpful insights to do with you know, spiritual abuse and uh, leadership issues like that. And, and obviously that's very relevant at the moment in many, in, well, in many areas. So we do need to learn and, and really have good conversations about these matters. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna just try and talk a little bit about the concept of biblical authority. Um, because when we use the word someone in authority, we can think of it in a, in a worldly way, or we can think of it in a biblical way. And, and um, I've got some quotes that I'll try, I'll just have to change the wording a little bit because they're quite long. So I'll just try and make them a little shorter. So Tom Marshall, in his book, Understanding Leadership, he says, when I choose to obey true authority, I do not feel inferior or put down in any way because true authority respects my moral freedom. Obedience is my free choice. But when so-called authority seeks to impose another person's will on mine or brings emotional or intellectual pressure to bear, this does not respect my moral freedom. I can conform or rebel, but neither is likely to bring any real satisfaction. I think that's an excellent summary of spiritual authority. We don't force people to do things. We're, we're, we're seeking to, um, uh, you know, give people choices all the time. Then uh, uh, D.E. Host, he says this, when someone who is in official position demands obedience of another person, irrespective of that person's reason and conscience, this is the spirit of tyranny. When on the other hand, by exercising tact and sympathy, by prayer, spiritual power, sound wisdom, a person is able to influence and enlighten another person so that that person through the medium of his own reason and conscience is led to alter one course and adopt another, that is true spiritual leadership. So again, it's about influence with godly means and godly methods. And Menno Simons said, spiritual authority, now this is a very good quote, you've got to think about this one, spiritual authority is never there to make rebellious people conform. Its only purpose is to enable the obedient person to live a holy life. Therefore, it rests on submission and obedience freely given. Furthermore, spiritual authority has only got spiritual means at its disposal. Its only weapons are prayer, scripture, counsel, and the power of a holy life. So it's a very, very different definition of authority when we talk about spiritual authority. It's not a a kind of a bullying or overbearing of someone's will on someone else. In actual fact, in the qualifications for eldership in, in Timothy and Titus, it says someone who's going to be appointed as an elder or someone who's functioning as an elder shouldn't be overbearing. You know, there shouldn't be sort of like a force of personality that makes people intimidated or makes them feel bullied or, or manipulated which is why it's always good, I think, for Pete, every one of us that is in any position of authority, it's good for us to actually be under authority ourselves, that someone, some people also have the right to speak into our lives. So we don't become a law under us, unto ourselves. We have to ask the question, what is the goal of spiritual authority? Well, it, Paul said it's to, that the, the people would come to the obedience that comes from faith. So our goal in leadership is to lead the church into God's vision for that church. Not our own vision for the church, but what has God said about that church that we're serving? If you're serving a church, what does God want for that church? Spiritual authority is it, we've been entrusted to be ambassadors, to be stewards, so that God's purposes are brought into being, not our own agenda. And we're serving people so that they become 
everything that God wants them to be, not for us to uh, impose our agenda on them or for them to be uh, tools for us to use to get things done. That, that's not what spiritual authority is. Even church discipline must always have redemption and restoration as its goal. Its goal is never punishment. So all the time, our, our attitude, our focus, our motivation is redemption, uh, empowerment, uh, loving care, stewarding people into their destiny, into all that God's got for them. We are, we are there to serve people by leading them well. And the, the, the Bible talks about, a, uh, most often about a family framework for, for the Christian life and for God's church. It talks about mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. It's not, a, it's not an organization with rules. It's a family with relationships. Now, obviously in families, even abuse can take place in families. Of course it can, but we must understand that fundamentally we are all God's family together. Therefore, our interactions with each other are not based on hierarchy or titles or positions of power. They're based on relational DNA because we are one in Christ Jesus. So any gift, if someone has a gift of leadership, they're not senior to anybody else. They've just been entrusted with a gift that they must use for the blessing of everybody else in the family. It's not a seniority. There's no seniority in the kingdom of God. We are all at the same, uh, seated at the same table with Christ, as it were. Also, I've noticed over the years that sometimes leaders, when they lack, I suppose, what I would call a good measure of biblical authority, start to use guilt and manipulation to get people to do what they want to do. Now, in Titus 2.12, it says, the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Uh, and it says that we also, it says we must find out what pleases the Lord. So when we're discipling people and teaching people, I always take the attitude, I'm not going to tell you or anybody else what's right or wrong unless it's explicitly said in the scriptures. So in Ephesians, it says, you know, don't lie, don't steal, don't, you know, get angry and don't forgive people. Don't, you know, there are things that are obvious that we mustn't do. So I can tell people that. But I mustn't go beyond scripture's bounds and uh, tell people what films they can watch, what books they can read, what clothing they can wear, what haircuts, or whether they can have tattoos or not, whether they can drink alcohol, whether they can watch a certain film. If I start creating rules and impose those rules on people, I'm actually manipulating someone's conscience because it's the grace of God that teaches people to say no. And if I want people to be mature, I want to train them to be able to train their consciences. I don't want to keep people dependent on me. Oh, what does he say about this? So I had people come to me some years ago when the Harry Potter books came out and people were saying to me, uh, are you going to say anything about Harry Potter books? Should Christians read Harry Potter books? And I said, I'm not going to tell you my opinion on that. I would say, find out what pleases the Lord. The grace of God teaches you to say no to ungodliness. It could offend someone. It might offend, not offend someone else. And abuse can take place when we start to put rules onto people's lives that the Bible doesn't give us. Disputable matters, debatable matters. Like Paul talking about meat sacrifice to idols. Some people were going into the meat markets and saying, great, there's some cheap cuts of meat here. They've been used in temple services, but I don't mind that. It's good meat. Other people were saying, I can't possibly eat that. It's been sacrificed to demons. And Paul was saying, it's about your conscience. Find out for yourself what you feel before God is acceptable or not for you. And so telling people where they can go on holiday, what colour to paint their front door, who they can marry, what jobs they can have, all of these things stray into very, very unbiblical, manipulative, abusive uh, use of power and authority in Christian settings. 
our job is to help people become mature in Christ, to be able to live a godly life by their, the exercise of their own conscience and their knowledge of the scriptures. We've got to also understand people, and some people respond better to invitation. Some people respond better to challenge. It depends on their personalities. Any good leader will learn what kind of a person am I dealing with here? And if we only know one way, and that's, you know, I'm just going to admonish everybody and tell everybody off, um, we're going to, it says, doesn't it say in scripture, you know, uh, encourage the weak, strengthen the weak, and admonish the lazy. Now, if we get that the wrong way, we'll encourage the lady and warn the weak. And what happens is you end up just doing damage to everybody. We've got to learn how to treat each person according to their personality, their circumstance, and the way that they best receive um, authority, spiritual authority. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, you know, you don't have to use an axe to remove the fly that's landed on your friend's forehead. Now, sometimes we come in too hard with people and we have to learn tact. We have to learn um, to, to help people in an appropriate way. Um, it's also true to say, I would, uh, having been in leadership for a number of years now, I would say, if we feel we've got to sort everything out for everybody, that in itself can become a little abusive. Remember, Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen, 19, he said, that is why there are disputes among you. So it might be, so it will become evident on whom the grace of God rests. Now, sometimes as a leader, you have to learn when to just step back and watch something play out rather than micromanaging every single person's life because sometimes people learn and grow through going through a situation these are all things that i suppose over time we learn a little bit more about uh, a few other comments to make just about that that was about sort of leaders and abuse that they can bring into churches but i'd have to say i've i've learned many i've seen many situations where churches abuse leaders uh, and that is just as much uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, now, as if we're in leadership, we are to be the church's servant, but the church must never become our master. And there is a difference. We're called, I'm called, you are called to serve the church. We are not slaves to the church. I'm a slave to Christ, not a slave to his church. And if many often in many many churches where they've got a sort of a perhaps a pastor model where it's a one person leading uh, and they might have a bit of a team but it's one is all on one person uh, what happens is i've or they have a situation where the church is governed by voting or by some sort of diaconate board of some kind that whenever the person who's leading has got you know, real vision for where to take the church, everybody votes against them and they can't do anything. And I've seen scores of good leaders ruined by bad church uh, structure where the leaders themselves become abused by a system that's unbiblical. And it's a delicate balance uh, where you want to hear what the church is feeling about something. But if there's a plurality of eldership, which I believe is the biblical pattern, that's my own personal view from reading scripture, plurality of leadership, then that plurality of leadership needs to have the freedom to take the church in the direction that they really feel God wants them to go for the church's benefit. So churches can be, can be abusive places for leaders and, uh, I've seen many people burnt out because they they were in a, a church system that really didn't allow them to lead or held unreasonable expectations of them uh, that they should be at everybody's beck and call all the time. And that's that's really that's abusive in itself. Just a few thoughts on uh, accountability. I mean, I know I'm going through a lot of this very quickly, but it's that's the nature of the time limit we have. Uh, leaders and accountability. Um, as I just mentioned, I, I believe that New Testament uh, government is, uh, if the local church is always plural, you will never find any reference in the New Testament epistles to the leadership of a church being solely in the hands of one person. It is always plural. 
plurality of elders, teams of elders um, with shared equal authority, uh, operating according to the grace, gift and measure that is on each individual member of that eldership team. There needs to be permission given for someone with the gift of leadership to lead, uh, maybe lead that team, but there also needs to be a, an equality of, uh, of authority so that it is a safe, a safe place. And one person's gift can't become overly dominant in a team. If you have one person rising to dominance in a local church where nobody can question them, nobody can ever um, call them to, to account, it is the recipe for difficulties, even if they are the most wonderfully gifted person, because all of us, when we're left on our own, without any accountability, any sense of team, uh, we are making ourselves very, very vulnerable. I don't believe that's a nice way to lead either. It's not good for that person. Um, I do believe in genuine mutual team accountability, uh, especially as someone like myself who's translocal, so I serve lots of churches. I want people to speak into my life. I want to make myself accountable to not only to my local eldership team, but to those I'm serving with in the churches. I want people to feel free to question me, to look at what I'm doing, what I'm saying, and I want to be able to be uh, accountable. We've always taught in our own local church as well that if one of us preaches and we says something that isn't quite right or that the con a congregation thinks, I don't think that's quite right, we want them to have the freedom to come to us and say, when you said that in your message the other day, I, I, I'm not sure that, that was biblical. Um, and that's happened to me perhaps half a dozen times in, well, probably nearly 35 years uh, of, of, of um, leadership now. Uh, and I've been grateful every time someone's come to me and said, I think what you said wasn't biblical there. And I looked at it and I thought about it. And I thought on most occasions, it was me just badly uh, making a bad choice of words rather than it being my theology was wrong. It was I didn't express it well in the moment. I, I didn't choose my words well. And so when people have pointed that out to me, the next week I've then stood up and I've said, I just want to say when I said this last week, that was not correct. What I should have said and what I was trying to say was this, and I'm grateful someone pointed that out to me. Now, I think that then gives me a chance to model accountability to my church. And it also gives the church confidence that they can speak directly to, the, uh, to those in authority over them when they think there's an issue. Now, that's not the same thing as people coming complaining at you all the time. That, that's not what I'm talking about. If people just want to complain and criticize, then they need, then they need a little bit of help maturing. I'm talking about genuine, seasoned, wise people who just are looking out for you and trying to make sure that something you said, um, uh, you know, might have been a mistake and, and needs a little attention. I put some out, um, a, a tweet out recently uh, and uh, someone in one of our churches just sent me a message saying, did you mean to say what you've said? Because it could sound like this. And I read it again. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I've not really read it like that. And I thanked them. I said, thank you for saying that. So I just took it down and reposted it with a better word. And I said to them, thank you for watching my back. Thank, thank you that you did that. So I don't feel criticized by that. I feel helped. I feel safe uh, because I feel people are genuinely, they won't try to say, look, you did something wrong. They're trying to say, oh, just be careful here. You just might be misunderstood. So I think that's good. Find friends who you can trust, who can genuinely speak into your life. That's what your team should be like, really. Um, I would also say, this is, uh, I wish I had more time to explain this one, but I'll, I'll try my best. Each of us has got a, a grace gift from God. And it says, doesn't it, in the scriptures that the, the, the call and the, the, the anointing and the call from God are irrevocable. You know, so once God has given us grace and anointing, he, he won't take it back. It's given to us, which is why you can find some people can be very, very fruitful in their ministry and their gift. And yet they can be doing all kinds of sinful things behind behind the background. And you think, well, why is why is God blessing 
uh, what they're doing, their gift. Why is he blessing their gift when their personal life is, is in shreds? Well, it's because he's entrusted them with a gift. And when someone's got that gift, they can choose what they do with it. They can abuse it or they can steward it well. God, if you like, has trusted us. He's entrusted us with something uh, that he expects us to use in the way he would use it. If Jesus would use it, if he were here, we're doing it on his behalf. We have the right, because he's given us that free choice. We have the right to do what we will with what God gives us. We can abuse it or we can use it properly. And sometimes you find that people have character issues that mean that for some reason they have to either stop using their gift for a season altogether because they've really disqualified themselves. Or it can be that you just need to rein someone back in for a little while and say, you, you've just got to adjust this because that's ruining your gift. And I remember um, Terry, Terry Virgo said to me once about um, these kinds of matters. He said, always in your mind, think this to yourself, think, protect the gift protect the gift uh, and what he meant by that was we must do everything we can when someone either has done something wrong or is, is it needs a bit of adjustment correction you know they need a little bit of a little bit of um, spiritual discipline in some way we must always think you've got a gift that God has given you I want to help you get back to a place where your gift can be used fully again and it's really important we protect the gift. We look at the person, we think, no, you've got a grace that God has given you. I don't want to take you out of the game. I want to try and help you so that you can, you, you can be in a safer place because I want to protect your gift. I think that that's really helped me over the, over the years. Um, I think in teams, it's important we don't ever say, about people's behavior or speech or whatever. We don't just say, oh, that's just him or that's just her. That's just what they're like. No, don't put things under the carpet, as we say. Don't just sweep it all under the carpet and put the carpet back down and pretend it isn't there. That doesn't help anybody because eventually the, bu the bump in the carpet becomes very big and people keep tripping over it. It's no good saying, oh, they're just like that. Well, they shouldn't be like that. So someone has to lovingly address that matter. Otherwise, it'll damage them and damage uh, damage the, the rest of the church. Uh, so let me just think of a few other things I can say. Okay, some, some things to begin to perhaps pray for. I would say it's not incidental that Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. There is a principle of team. There's a principle of accountability. There's a principle of friends on the journey. And ask God to surround you with a team of friends who have the same vision, the same values, who are on a journey with you together. It's a great blessing to be doing mission for God in plurality. It's one of the reasons we called our family of churches relational mission, because the two have to go together. If you just do mission, but you've got no relationships, it's very driven. It's very, very unpleasant and you'll burn out and you get exhausted because it's just do, do, do all the time. If you just have relationships, it might be very cozy and nice, but you won't go anywhere. It'll just become very insular and in, inward looking. But if you put relationship with mission, man, that's powerful because friends together on the journey, I think is God's is God's way. You remember when Paul arrived somewhere and he looked around and he said, oh, Titus isn't here. So he didn't stay. So an open door for Paul, he didn't even go through it if his friend wasn't there that he could do this together with. He knew that friendship, that partnership, team was mission critical. And so he even held back on going through a door because he'd have had to go through it on his own. He didn't want to. He wanted to know that there was a real team with him. Um, yeah, I think... Um, let me just see if there's, I've been picking a few things out at random. Um, see if there's anything else I've missed. Um, no, I think that's probably all I want to say. I've given you a lot of things there, I realise. Uh, oh, yeah, just one other thing I will say. Uh, 
it has been said just on this point of friendship it has been said by people oh don't 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 let the rest if you're a, a team leader um don't appoint elders who are your friends don't, don't have friends working with you because you know they're colleagues they're people you might have to fire or move or you've got to be distant um i think that's nonsense i, I just don't see that in the bible at all so you might say yeah but isn't it painful if you sometimes have got friends and then there's difficulties yes it's painful but it's biblical jesus went through pain he said i've called you friends i haven't called you servants i called you friends and yet some of his friends caused him great pain he didn't say actually i'm going to redefine it now actually you're all going to be you know um slightly distant from me now i'm not going to not going to get to know you that well because it's too painful I've been through, as many people on this call, many times when great pain you go through in leadership over the years and you lose friends. Um, and, it, and it's difficult sometimes, very painful. But that doesn't mean we should adjust the biblical concept just because we had to pay a high price at some point. And I would rather go again and take the risk again uh, and try to be try to build biblically than put up these walls around myself to to self-protect which actually doesn't self-protect you anyway it just makes you you know a very aloof person which can't and people can pick that up they can pick out pick up whether your heart is connecting with them or not